Turning us now is Ojinika Jinx, okay? Quiz stories trending around the world. What's going Hello, on Jinx? Today? What's going on with this? <laughs> that was really delivered. It had a sing song <laughs> to kind of sang it there. Good he morning. inspires me too. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'll do the sing song voice. Good morning, to do. How are you? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, this was you. I used to sing for every day. I used to stop singing. I don't like don't worry. Oh, Jinika, we'll, pepe, we'll introduce it soon. Pepe, don't worry. Pepe, How are you? Good morning. How's it going on? A little early this morning. Why yeah. not? Let's start what's trending. Good morning to you viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United Kingdom, Prime Minister Boris Johnson offered members of Parliament what he called a wholehearted apology on Tuesday for breaking his own COVID-19 restrictions, but claimed he didn't know the 2020 birthday gathering thrown in his honor was an illegal party in his first comments to lawmakers since he was fined by police last week. I repeat, that was my mistake and I apologize for it unreservedly. In the United States, Vladislav Yashipenko a Ukrainian journalist imprisoned in Crimea is set to be honored next month with the Pan Barbie Freedom to Write Award. The 53-year-old journalist was arrested in March last year and was recently sentenced to six years in a Russian labor camp for alleged possession and transport of explosives. Yashipenko has denied the allegations and has said he confessed after being tortured and threatened with death. In Nigeria, officers of the country's Air Force are feared to have been killed in a plane crash that occurred on Tuesday in Kaduna State. Authorities are still confirming the casualties. The incident involves a training aircraft which had two pilots on board. Under sports, Liverpool outclassed Manchester United 4-0 at the Anfield Stadium on Tuesday to go top of the Premier League. Manchester United were without their team's forward, Cristiano Ronaldo, following the death of his infant son. Both sets of supporters at the stadium paid a moving tribute with applause in the seventh minute of the game. Finally, under entertainment, actor Johnny Depp took the stand on Tuesday to tell jurors that he felt compelled to sue his ex-wife, Amber Heard, for libel out of an obsession for the truth after she accused him of domestic violence. Depp flatly denied ever hitting her, calling the domestic allegations against him disturbing, heinous, and not based on any species of truth. Uh, Ms. Heard made uh, some quite heinous and um, disturbing criminal um, acts um, against uh, me that uh, that were not based in any species of truth. It was a, it was a complete shock uh, that it would it it just didn't need to go in that direction. Well, let's begin what's trending in Ivory Coast, where the country's president, Alassane Ouattara, has named the governor of the regional central bank, Tiemeko Kone, as his deputy, making him the front runner to become the next leader of the world's biggest cocoa grower. The 73-year-old economist previously served as minister of construction in the Ivorian government before taking up the position of governor of the Central Bank of West African States in 2016. His appointment as vice president marks the start of a race to succeed 80-year-old President Ouattara, who will step down after serving three terms in 2025. Ouattara also reappointed Patrick Achi as prime minister, which vies with the deputy president as the second most powerful position in the country's government. I believe you guys had discussed this earlier, Dr. Vati, in the Road to mm. segment, but I guess the conversation always is the fact that the central go uh, bank governor, Nigeria's central bank governor, is still in the uh, position that he is, saying that he doesn't want to be president of Nigeria at this point, and people are saying, you know, he should come out, or Nigeria's president should come out to say that he's probably backing him. I guess this is the um, comparison at this point. 
Okay, well, I mean, uh, Ivory Coast presents uh, a very instructive, very interesting uh, proposition with what uh, President uh, Alassane Ouattara has done. President Alassane Ouattara assumed office in 2011, and he was entitled to, to, a two, to two terms, as is the case in the Nigerian constitution also here uh, as president. But he then decided to extend his tenure. It was very controversial at the time. And, you know, he's uh, in his third term, which would uh, end in, uh, you know, 2025. Now, that position of vice uh, president as in Ivory Coast has been vacant since 2020 with the death of Koulibaly, uh, who was occupying that position at the time. He died in office, and President Ouattara, you know, decided not to put another person in that position. Until yesterday, when, you know, uh, Parliament, uh, you know, announced Tekome uh, Kone as uh, the new uh, vice uh, president. And in the calculus there, you know, it looks like uh, this is uh, President Ouattara endorsing him mm. because he described him as a brilliant technocrat and as, uh, an uh, as an outstanding technocrat and a brilliant economist. This gentleman, having served as Minister of Construction previously and also uh, as, uh, you know, Central Bank Governor for the uh, BCAO, you know, so people say, oh, he's in poor position. But you recall that the Prime Minister resigned. Archie, Prime Minister Archie. But the President also recalled that Prime Minister and made him, you know, Deputy President. But the position of Vice President is higher than that of the uh, uh, Deputy President. So the game that is going on in uh, 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 Cote d'Ivoire, clearly, is an indication that 80-year-old uh, Alassane Ouattara is not likely to come and say again that he wants a fourth term in office. Because when he got a third term, he was accused of violating uh, the Constitution. So the process in uh, you know, Cote d'Ivoire going forward is likely to be uh, very interesting. Very uh, uh, privileged country, the mm -hmm. world's largest producer of uh, cocoa. Mm -hmm. But as I said earlier, when we took on this subject, 24 hours is a long time in politics. Yes. Yes. This may give an indication that his successor may have been anointed. Uh, mm. Second, uh, there are other variables. Mm. Anything else can happen. There is no guarantee uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Kone would not be challenged. There's also no guarantee. There are other African countries where we have seen persons anointed and eventually they fell out mm. or such persons were wrong-footed by mm. other persons interested in the throne. So mm. there are many variables that you can see. The only thing you can be sure of is that maybe uh, the uh, uh, identification of Kone may discourage some people from showing interest in the race. You try to link Nigeria mm. with yes, it. And I said, well, in Nigeria, the key difference is that President Muhammad Ubuari has not identified anybody publicly. He has not, uh, you know, signaled in any direction beyond just saying, he knows who his favorite is, but that he didn't want that favorite uh, to be uh, slaughtered uh, mm. by those who may not want him. And, mm. you know, I told uh, uh, Rotus Udiri uh, when he brought up this subject, I suspect that the reason for focusing on the Avorian situation is to see if we can draw parallels. Mm. Uh, but here in Nigeria, yes, there are people who are trying to persuade the central bank governor. And I said, the interest will probably be that an economist mm. is what Nigeria needs now, with our economy falling flat on its face, with so much deprivation uh, in the country. But uh, Central Bank Governor of Nigeria himself has not been anointed publicly, the same way in which uh, President Obasanjo anointed Umaru Yaradwa, uh, the same way other presidents have done it. He himself, you know, says he's focusing on his job as central bank governor. But mm. definitely, what we can take away beyond the personalities is that whoever wants to be president of Nigeria in 2023 will be somebody who has some basic understanding of what, how important the economy is yeah. to the mm. survival of the country and the survival of all of us, all of us who live within it. That's very important. Well said, Dr. Patti. So, I mean, so let me expatiate on some things I said before. The Ivorian politics is quite very different. Mm. And, you know, when we're trying to draw similarities, let's be careful. Uh, President Alisa Ouattara came in after a protracted battle. 
and there was a civil war afterwards that Laurent Gbogbo had to go to International Criminal Court and there were factions of rebels everywhere. So the Ivorian case is quite very dire. You know, there are some people that have not come back into Ivory Coast now, some former rebel leaders and the likes. Uh, Alison Ouattara has been trying to hold on to power. He feels he has a right to it. He's used the power of incumbency to organize sham elections. The last elections he did, the likes of them, Conor Bedier, they were all against him and the other opposition parties. In fact, they boycotted the election on the day of the election. But Alisson Ouattara put himself in power because, like you said, rightly, Dr. Abati Koulibaly died. That was supposed to be the successor, but he died. And afterwards, he did put in somebody else in there. Hambank, as it's formerly called, Hamed Bakayoko, very popular media entrepreneur and all of that. But Bakayoko too passed due to cancer. So after Bakayoko passed, he's been iffy. Because when you look across the political ranks, there's not that direct push or, can I say, trust like he had for Bakayoko for Patekashi. And that's why you saw that Patekashi position, you know, he had to resign as prime minister recently, and now he called him back. Then he's put Kone in, which is taking that position of, you know, Kulibali that passed. And now to balance things out. So it's going to be a fight to finish. But you see why people should not think even an endorsement can give you everything. Because there's a tailspin to it. A couple of months back, Lorong Bagbo came back to town. When Lorong Bagbo came back, it was welcome, it was celebrated. Lorong Bagbo has been having talks with Alison Watera. And there are still some other people in the field that go out there, you know, for these elections. And another case I would like to juxtapose with the Ivorian case is what is happening currently in Kenya. Mm. Look at the polls. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta is favoring Odinga because he has a very long fight with his vice president, uh, William Ruto. But Ruto is doing better in the polls, and that election, too, is coming up. We've also seen the case that even the power of the incumbency can be broken on the African continent. A clear case is Ghana, where you thought like uh, uh, John Mahama was going to win the election when he was incumbent. But the incumbent president, Nana Kufuadu, did beat him in the elections. So it's not hard and fast. There are a lot of variables. So even if anybody's anointed, you must also look at the other variables as regards the electionarian process. And that's why it's not hard and fast. Mostly, the candidate should come into the fray, but politics is not as easy as that. And even Alisa Watara putting in this man there, Temo Kone, mm. is not a hard and fast rule because a lot of people still even argue with the last election he did. All the other candidates boycotted that election and some people still say the election was a sham. Coming back to Nigeria, I think it's incumbent on anybody that wants to make declaration to declare. But even if you get the backing of the presidency, is that it all? Because we also forget that Nigerians too will play an important part on who votes to become president. And like Mike Guinea was saying here a couple of minutes ago, that it's now harder to rig elections. In fact, President Mohamed Buhari corroborated it. It's front page this day, this morning, of how hard and difficult now it is to rig election in Nigeria because of the technology like Beavers and the likes that Anek has put in place. Mm. So I think the watchword for any candidate that will make his declaration should be go and romance the people. Because your major constituent, apart from your backing years, we might give you a safe footing and all of that, will be the Nigerian people and what you can do for them and help them to bring them out of the economy quagmire. So anything you think you have going for you can be flipped over time. You've seen even that strongman mentality being broken in African electionary process. And it happens over and over again. Well said, Rufai. Tundra Biola. I'm finding this whole conversation completely nauseating. An 80-year-old man who sat tight for a third term, now seeking to appoint his successor. Unfortunately for him, his original candidate passed on. The second candidate he wanted, unfortunately, passed, passed on. on. And he still insists on trying to foist his will on the people after a third term at 80. I mean, what on earth is this? I find it completely disgusting. Is it a democracy or is it a monarchy? 
This conversation for me, the whole thing is completely shameful. I'm sorry. Power is sweet. So <laughs> it's very hard to African give up. Leaders. It's a disgrace. African yeah. leaders see themselves yeah. as much. As yes, modern. it's a disgrace. That's, that's and that, 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 that for me is yes. the point here. Yeah. Before any other flowery <laughs> analysis we want to make, that is the bottom line. It is completely disgraceful. It's unfortunate to drop your laugh. Uh, Neo Shudare calls it the Kabiesi syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Shudare in a famous essay in his watch. Well, all right. Let's take another story. Presidential aspirant on the platform of the People's Democratic Party and Governor of River State, Yesom Wike on Monday, paid a courtesy visit to the Governor of Kano State, Abdullahi Ganduje, who is a member of the All Progressives Congress, to solicit support for his presidential bid. While during the courtesy visit, in a video that is now making the rounds on social media, Governor Ganduje told Governor Wike that he appreciates his efforts in vying for president, but that he will lose the election. Let's take a look. You have come to see your brothers and sisters, which is good, aspiring to be the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Well, I foresee good efforts. At the end of it, you will lose, but you will be a good loser. <laughs> I appreciate good losers because we have courage. And since you are doing it peacefully, then you will live long to fight again. <laughs> when you are opponents, when those who are fighting you, they describe you as wicked, wicked. <laughs> And when I listen to your speech across the country, I say, this wicked is not wicked, but this wicked is a wise wicked. <laughs> I thought this was quite cute. First of all, you tell him you're not going to win. Then you now tell him that I think you're wise for running for the election. How wise are you if you know you're not going to win, Dr. Abati? Well, actually, <laughs> this video, in my view, provides only one side of the story. Yeah. Um, and I see that this is a side of it that has been popular on yes. social media because it is sensational. Uh, because Gandhi J tells, you know, governor of River State, well, you know, I, I praise you for your courage. Mm -hmm. um, you come in to me and all of that. You are a wise man. But I don't think you will win. You will lose. And, uh, but I know you as a good loser, blah, blah, blah. In the first place, we don't expect Ganduje, governor of Kano State, a member of okay. the All Progressives Congress, to say anything different. I mean, his commitment is to support whoever comes up in his own party. And I think that he was speaking, you know, in a playful spirit to say you will not win in any case, but I salute your courage. But he said some other things that uh, the reporters have not focused on, like Prison Wiki for having a very diverse uh, team, campaign team, and for reaching out uh, to other parts of the country, including uh, the opposition. And both Ganduje and uh, Wiki himself, they stressed the point about unity the point about leaders of Nigeria to come together across party lines to promote unity and understanding in the country. And also, you know, Wiki also, I guess, in jest, made a point that if Ganduje was running, if he had been a candidate in the election, he probably would not even join uh, the presidential uh, race. But these are two politicians across party lines you know, trying to reach out to each other. And I think, it, you know, it looks good. It's not as if Ganduje is going to come with delegates to the PDP uh, uh, primaries. It's not as if Wike is in a position to take delegates to APC, uh, uh, you know, but Kano is strategic. It is. And I guess that's why Wike is yes, also targeting smart. Kano yeah. to go there, engage with the people, pay cuts a call to the governor so that people will know that, you know, Kano is very strategic. That's uh, after Lagos, the largest number of voters in Nigeria. So I don't think there's any politician that, that can discount the electoral value of uh, uh, Kano State, Kano, in, Kano City uh, in particular. So, you know, I don't think that we should dwell too much on the sensational uh, part of it. And as for Wiki, in terms of being a loser or whatever, <laughs> good loser, bad loser, he had made it clear that 
he is committed to the People's Democratic Party. Yes, he did. And he had made it clear that despite his ambition, whatever decision the People's Democratic Party takes at the end of the day, he will remain in the party and work for the party. And I guess in the same manner in which uh, Gan, Gan, DJ or Gandola, Gan, 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 Gan yes. in the same manner in which <laughs> you know, Governor Ganduje you know, is going to stay within his party. It's what we'd like to see is good relations, yeah. you know, sportsmanship, friendship, promotion of serious ideals mm -hmm. rather than, uh, you know, uh, animosity. Yeah. I would have liked it if the two men had gone for that uh, beyond the theme of unity to talk about other more important issues that will resonate with average Nigerians. So this point about you be a good loser, a bad loser. No, we, we don't want banter. <laughs> you know, we want focus on serious issues yes. as you move forward. Tundu, mm. your thoughts on Governor Ganduje's comments. I Gan like the way you Duj stress that. Duj Ganduje. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank fantastic. you for the uh, reminder. Thank you very much. Well, yes, you're right. What else was he going to say? He's mm. never mm. going to say a PDP candidate yeah. will win. Obviously, he's hoping an APC candidate wins, but it's not up to him. He's not in PDP. He's mm. not going to be one of the delegates that decides who gets to clinch that presidential ticket. He's not one of the millions of registered voters who we hope are the ones who will decide who will be the next president of Nigeria. But from our previous nauseating conversation, it's not about anointed successes. It's about the people going out to vote. But I do like the fact that there was some kind of, you know, tongue-in-cheek banter going on there. And it's good to see that that's possible between the parties. We do get, get a lot I of like rancor, yes, yes, between APC and PDP. Ganduje is a major APC stalwart. Um, Wike is a huge PDP stalwart. So that, that was good to see. But yes, they, I hate this practice of successors and traipsing off to, to visit and get the anointing of the owners of Nigeria. All of this sort of focus on, you know, the elite at the expense of the masses who are the ones in whose hands democracy is reposed. Absolutely. I find it utterly disgusting in whatever incarnation in which it rears its head. Rufai. So for me, you know what I've just been wondering since all of this uh, baridarida called you consultation. Baridarida <laughs> means parambulating, called okay. consultation started. Especially for the governors that are running. I'm asking, with all this Busy, busy, they have been busy. Who is running their states? I mean, it's just some thought in my mm. head, though. Because the last time I've seen many governors run here and there, helter skelter, name of consultation, and they forget they have states to run. Maybe just maybe we should start telling governors to maybe you have to resign if you want to run for another position. Because you see, the people of those states need their they governors. Need them, yeah. And there are a lot of things that they ought to do for them. As far as I'm concerned, yes, he can go and meet Governor Ganduje, but of what economic value is going to be to him getting delegates? Governor Ganduje is an APC, or does he oversee PDP delegates? I think the person he should have met with, which was a PDP governor, he's a very good friend, Obaseki, that he has not met with in Edo states. At least if he meets with that one, that one can give him, they can talk about delegates, he can give him delegates, but Governor Ganduje... That's why he's saying and bantering that oh, you will lose, blah, 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 and all of that. But really, yes, state, you are visiting him because you're a fellow colleague governor. And everything. But is he going to bring out the delegate numbers? No. The people you should have been talking to are the disgruntled people in Kano State that you think you can still echo out something from. Another person, but anyway, when you look at it, Kwan Kasu has gone to NMPP. So maybe it should be more about the PDP in Kano that can give him delegates. I think that's the most important thing. Because now, he needs that delegate number to be able to cross the line. But in all of this, I think largely, these politicians take Nigerians for granted too much. And it is obvious. When you even hear the kind of, the kind of uh, laser fair talk they are talking in the name of this, their campaign and consultation, that's not what is biting an average Nigerian like you and me. But Dr. Abati is the price of jollof rice increase that is biting him. The fact that you have to spend 7.3% more to make a pot of jollof rice. I didn't make it up. <laughs> but it's true. There is a jollof rice. There's a jollof rice. No, I saw it. By I've SBM. Seen it. I've seen it. That's true. Yes, For business is. owners, yes. is the price of diesel. The fact that diesel has gone up in has stayed there. For an average motorist in Bielsa, like Ovite Major did a good report this morning, is the fact that they say we have subsidy and we are, we are supposed to be selling fuel for 165 naira per liter, but in Bielsa it's 200 naira per liter. 
And they told the Minister of State for Petroleum about it. He said, okay, we'll bring them to book. Till today, they are still selling fuel for over 200 naira per litre in Bielsa. And the Bielsans will look and say, oh, yeah, they my backyard. And they don't reap the benefit and dividend of it. For an average reverse person, it is the case of suit that is affecting their health and over 40% unemployment rates. But all of these people don't talk about the challenges when they go for their consultation, except few of them. Mm. What most of them do is to banter. Hey, my brother, give me your votes. Give me your vote. Give me your vote. Uh -uh. Except, Nigerians need better. Except to clarify that the visit by Wise Wiki, as uh, Wise Wiki. Ganduje like called, called them, to Ganduje was a court visit. Okay. I imagine that the primary constituency that uh, Governor Wiki will have gone to see will be PDP members in Kano. Right. And they're there. There's a strong PDP constituency still in place. Mm. And as for you know him showing interest in the presidency, Section 8412 refers to appointees, persons who have been appointed, not elective people holding elective offices. And in any case, he has a deputy. If he's campaigning around, we hope that he will make good use of his uh, Deputy. Today. If that deputy is empowered, if that deputy yeah. does not go to meetings, as Garu Bashewu is alleging, to slip off <laughs> you see, you know, <laughs> and disappear from a virtual That's meeting. That's what we are saying. Uh, they are the ones right. to quickly call the deputy spear tire. They are the ones to disempower the deputy, but they can gallivant all around. You can see the problem with democracy in Nigeria. Well said, guys. We'll take another story. Highlighting Jonathan Ola Kunle, also known as the Environment Spider-Man who has embarked on a quest to stop improper waste disposal in Oshobo Oshun State. Ola Kunle started the environmental cleanup exercise in 2004 because he wasn't happy with the way he saw waste littering in his neighborhood. Clad in a Spider-Man costume, Ola Kunle goes around his state picking trash from drainage, marketplaces, and wherever he sees waste. In a recent interview with BBC News Africa, Ola Kunle, who refers to himself as Nigeria's Spider-Man, said he chose the Spider-Man costume to draw attention to let people know that they can also be heroes of the environment. There is a disparity when Africans travel out of Africa to a place like Europe, uh, America, they begin to abide by the law of the land. But sadly, they come back to Africa, they begin to litter anyhow. We should stop this, the belief that we are dirty people there's so much litter in our society today because there is no regulation. You no longer see sanitation officials visiting homes on a regular basis. The reason why I'm putting on the Spider-Man costume is to draw people's attention because when I'm in Mufti and I go out for my clean up exercise and I tell people to join me, majority of the people that I meet don't want to be part of the exercise. So it became a plan to put on the Spider-Man costume so that I can get the attention of the people so that they will love what I'm doing and they will also become a hero. I mean, this was, I mean, this is so inspirational. I've been mm -hmm. trying to take this story for a week now. I have not seen this type of gesture from Nigerians in a long time. This is so Southless, mm -hmm. I love everything about yes. it. This gives new meaning to friendly neighborhood yes. Spider-Man. Yes. You remember? Yes. 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 And I love the particular costume that he chose. I love Spidey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just the fact that he's dressed up, he's completely right. If he wasn't dressed up, no. he would just be a yeah. man and picking up like trash. That, yeah. The yeah. fact that he's dressed up and he's putting so much into it, he's even doing all the poses. It's yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. He's going to encourage and really inspire a lot of people. And he makes really good points about that environmental sanitation that was like a, an official every Saturday, was it last Saturday of the month? Mm -hmm. Routine that we all had to observe in this country. That's gone by the wayside, like so much else in this society. Yes. What kept us sane, what kept us whole in this society, we've managed to just bin mm -hmm. one way or Maybe another. So he's completely right about yeah. that. I love everything about this story. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. yeah. and highlighting. Yeah. I thought so. Yes. Well, I think that uh, the gentleman, uh, Jonathan Olakunle, is to be commended. The United Nations had pointed out that a major threat, you know, to uh, peace and stability and the survival of our planet is uh, this crisis of uh, pollution, of waste, waste pollution.
billions of waste discharged into the environment uh, every year. And the group of international experts is saying that we face the challenge of carbon emission. Uh, persons like Greta Thunberg, Thunberg, you know, are leading that campaign, and that young person, you know, is providing the kind of leadership that you do even get uh, from uh, world leaders. And one of the major outcomes in all these discussions about waste, climate change, and all that, is that you need climate change champions. You need, uh, you know, environment champions. So uh, this gentleman, Mr. Lakunle, is one of those examples of, uh, you know, a good champion in this regard, joining in the tradition of the likes of the Swedish uh, uh, campaigner, uh, Greta Thurberg. Yeah. Now, however, in Nigeria also, you know, this is not new. We have had many cases. In 2019, I think, uh, the Dangote Group, you know, did something what they call the Sustainability Initiative, in which the company tried to mobilize about 200 champions uh, to help protect the environment. We have had even the Lagos State government uh, under this administration, you know, trying to promote the protection of the environment. And we have individuals, artists, who have turned metals, you know, uh, waste metals, who have recycled them to create art mm. out of it, to say that, look, it's not everything that is out there. There is a gentleman around the, the coastline of Lagos that has an NGO, he's been on this program before, who is also trying to protect the coastline you know, as a result of waste. But the big extension of it is what is called the Waste to Wealth Initiative. There is a young man somewhere in uh, Lagos yeah, who won an award for turning waste to wealth. There is one, Alaji Sulaiman, in Owodi Onire, who is using scrap metals more creatively. So the thing to do is for government to focus more, you know, on the environment. We have a Ministry of Environment. Yeah. Every uh, onga. That's United Nations General Assembly. There is always a paragraph in the president of Nigeria's speech about protecting the environment and Nigeria's commitment to uh, climate change. Are we doing enough mm -hmm. as a country to encourage these uh, you know, champions uh, like Olakunle? Yes. And are we paying enough attention to the environment? The uh, sanitation day that you refer to, well, it survived. Every Saturday, Nigeria were forced to clean their environment until someone went to court and challenged it. And the, and the court ruled that it was illegal. And it, uh, and it was on the basis of that that many of these states uh, no longer do environmental day uh, or, or every last Saturday of the month. But oh. the importance of the environment cannot uh, be queried. I'm tempted so, to buy a Spider-Man costume for you. Um, yeah, fact, so you I, can love, be our, I, I feel like you could be a Spider-Man. But real quickly, it's just an indication of the failure of our Nigerian system. And I'm happy that citizens are taking up the challenge. If government is wise, they should look at this mm. and start doing something as regards it. You know, back in the days, there used to be a case of people they call wole wole. Sanitary inspectors. Sanitary inspectors that would even come inspect your house. And I think the court ruling as regards uh, environmental sanitation is against the restriction of movement. That yeah. didn't stop us from still cleaning our environment on Saturdays. What the government should do is to bring back the sanitary officers and people should be fined for not cleaning their environment. It's as simple as that. They should just bring it Concerning back, yes. our environment, our environment is a problem, Mo Oji. The water across the coastline is seeping in. They ma you need, that's another topic. If we start here, we'll not finish as regards that. Encroachment of water bodies and... <laughs> well, what can I say? A round of applause to Olakun Lake. Well done, congratulations. Yeah. Nigeria is proud of you, and we are so thankful for you. Well, that's all I have for you on What's Trending today. I'll see you tomorrow.